Hello, I am Kurana from School of Management, IGNU. Marketing strategy is akin to strategy of war or a game of chess, where different players assess the environment and competition, analyze various moves or alternatives, plan them, implement them, and see the results of their moves or actions, competitors' moves, and interactions thereof. In this program, we would discuss marketing, its philosophy, marketing strategy, including its globalization aspects, with Professor Philip Kotler, who is a world-renowned authority on the subject of marketing. He teaches at the Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University in USA, which is currently rated as the top school of management in that country. Let us first discuss about marketing philosophy. What are the likely developments in this area? We do normally talk about four P's of marketing. But is marketing just four P's? Or is there more to it? Surprisingly, marketing is a relatively new subject and science. It should not be confused with selling, which is one of the world's oldest disciplines and practices. Uh, really, uh, the concept of marketing changes the focus from the seller to the buyer. And it raises the question, how do we really serve buyers? And when we compete, uh, we can become a more profitable company if we understand the buyers better and meet the needs better than competitors are able to do. So the basic idea of marketing is what we call defining your target market. That is not going after everyone. Everyone is not going to be interested in your product, but rather deciding who you can serve well, and then figuring out their needs and wants, and then uh, adjusting your product, your price, your place, and your promotion to reach them effectively and efficiently. Now, it's interesting. People ask me this question. Does, do marketers only respond to customers' needs, or do they change the needs and wants of customers? Well, there are really two types of companies. One is the company that says, uh, we're going to find out what people want and give it to them. We call this uh, responsive marketing. And it makes for good companies. After all, it's better than the case where you just say, we're going to sell people what we make and get them to buy it. So it's so responsive marketing is an advance over selling. But there but that makes a good company. It doesn't make necessarily a great company. A great company actually shapes the market and it anticipates needs and wants that aren't even felt yet by the consumer or the business customer. After all, many products have come into existence that no one ever imagined before, like fax machines and VCRs and video cameras. And it takes great companies to imagine new facilities, uh, new offers, new services that people will respond to. Now, I, I sometimes uh, describe this as the difference between being a market-driven company and a market-driving company. A market-driven company is a good company better than one that just is a selling-oriented company. A market-driving company is a great company because it really brings us along and raises our standard of living and our ideas of lifestyle and, and business uh, practice. Marketing strategy deals with taking a strategic stance to position oneself in the marketplace with an idea to optimize all the marketing activities with an objective to maximize the customer satisfaction. Now, there are a number of developments and refinements taking place in the area of marketing strategy. One such refinement is responding to time-based competition. Let us hear from Professor Kotler. What are his perceptions about the likely developments in the area of marketing strategy during, let's say, the next decade? Um, in the 1980s, quality became a concern. And people like Tom Peters and others uh, wrote books about In Search of Excellence. And uh, meanwhile, Japan was pursuing excellence and quality and gaining as a result of, uh, of achieving better quality. 
So that became the goal of many firms, including U.S. firms who had neglected quality. For example, Ford Motor uh, made good cars, but not the greatest cars. And then when they began to lose share, they studied the situation and they introduced a quality improvement process. That's what we call it, total quality improvement process. And uh, their quality has gotten much better. Now, when every company makes great cars, then that isn't enough of a differentiator. It makes the product once again into a sort of a commodity purchase. So we have to search for another way to be superior. And another way to be superior is through superior service. Let us say that two companies make a very fine car, but they differ in their service. That is their uh, repair service, uh, answering questions for you, uh, informing you uh, on how to use the product uh, more wisely and safely and so on. So service becomes a competitive variable. And may I say that in the uh, 90s, um, there will be this continuation of interest in improving quality and improving service. But there are some new things happening. One of them is what we call time-based competition. That is being able to speed up your product, your innovation, your production, your distribution, your service repair, and so on. And those companies that find out how to be faster will also be winners and we've seen that already we've seen um, that the Japanese companies can now create a new car in three years rather than five years uh, leaving behind American companies who are still working on a five-year turnaround basis although they're catching up to four years uh, recently um, take the fast food companies uh, what is their success well people value time uh, or at least more people are time sensitive. For example, uh, we pay a premium to uh, deliver mail faster. We do it through Federal Express or some, some other carrier. We pay more for uh, fax messages, but we value the, the time uh, reduction. Uh, we like to develop our film faster. We pay for one hour film um, development. We also um, I want our glasses to be made faster if we wear glasses and right now there's a one hour service in many parts of the United States for a new pair of glasses. So we're finding that uh, time is going to be perhaps the new variable for competition in the 90s. Now in addition to time I would mention a new another variable which we call customization. Um, well, we can't necessarily have our own dream home, our own dream car. But industry is finding ways to customize without much extra cost. I have seen companies that can, uh, that have automated their factories and each product coming off the line is a little different because of robotics and uh, flexible production and so on. Uh, well, since the product is closer to what the customer wants, then the uh, buyer will, the customer will pay more for it, and and that's another way to compete. Customization, I think, will be very important in the 90s. Most organizations start with a production orientation, and therefore the primacy of the production department. As the organization develops, competition heats up need is felt to be in closer contact with the customers to push the products and therefore a sales department is set up. As the market further develops, competition is even keener. Need is felt to add functions like advertising, marketing research, marketing planning. And then the issue arises whether there should be separate marketing department or one marketing department having all these functions. More often than not, all these functions are set up under the umbrella of the marketing department and which has sales, marketing research, advertising, marketing planning, etc. This also leads to the inevitable conflict between the primacy of the marketing department, its relationships with the other departments in the organization some sort of a power struggle also develops. What the end result would be does depend on the philosophical orientation of the organization, whether it's production driven, 
market driven or market driving. So in the organizational context, let's try to understand how the marketing departments evolve, what the relationships with the other departments are, and what are the future developments we can foresee in this context. Uh, in the beginning, companies did not have marketing departments, but sales departments. But sales departments are not marketing departments. In fact, uh, the birth of marketing departments uh, takes place when the sales department is given more activities to handle than just selling. For example, a sales department needs leads. Someone has to do research to find leads for new customers. And in addition, uh, marketing research has to be done to find out what people want. Well, the salesmen don't have the time to do it. Someone has to advertise the product uh, or promote it uh, other than in direct selling. So the result is that a number of uh, needs and jobs and tasks come up which collectively can be called marketing tasks. Sales being part of it, of course. Now, you usually uh, find a company appointing a marketing director to handle these non-selling tasks. And then over time that marketing director may start doing the marketing planning and telling the sales force what to say when they sell, what the price ought to be, uh, what segments uh, to pursue. And before you know it, the marketing director becomes a marketing vice president. Now, often the sales vice person remains a sales vice president and, and one does not work for the other, they cooperate. But you can see that if you want to really integrate your whole uh, marketing mix, Basically, the power should move eventually to the marketing group, um, which will set the strategy and get the resources and even identify what role the sales force will play in the larger picture. And so basically, over time, marketing has become a more major part uh, and power in companies. And sales has not been demoted, but it's been made part of the total operation. Now, this is a the good news. The bad news is that uh, when we leave theory and go into practice, we find that a lot of marketing and sales departments don't get along. The salespeople will often say that the, the price of the product is too high, the product isn't made the right way for the customers, they find it hard to sell, and they wish the marketing department was more able or competent. They blame the marketing department often. Meanwhile, the marketing department has its excuses and will say, well, I wish we had better salespeople. I wish they were more motivated. Why do they always want to bring down the price? Why don't they learn how to sell better? And so on. When you see this friction, then you know you have a, a real problem uh, and the need to harmonize marketing and sales. Now, suppose you succeed, and there are ways um, which consultants have found to bring together a harmonious relationship between marketing and salespeople. It takes a lot of steps and a lot of time, but it can be done and, and must be done. But then you're stuck with a further problem, and that is these other departments may not be market-oriented, customer-oriented. So you have an R&D department, and they don't listen to the customer. They simply design products which meet their high engineering standards, but may not meet uh, the technical or the human standards and wishes of, of the final buyer. So we find that uh, we must bring the R&D people and the engineers to meet the customers, to get a sense of what really would sell and how it should be designed. Actually, my position is that the customer should be part of the design team. Well, many companies didn't do this. The, as obvious as it is, many companies never brought in the customer, and of course their products half the time would fail. So um, we're saying that we need a feedback loop, uh, and getting those that kind of department, engineering and R&D, to be customer-driven and, and customer-sensitive. And not only them, what about the manufacturing people who might want to compromise the right design in order to save money? What about the purchasing people? who might want to substitute a cheaper ingredient for a, a better ingredient. Uh, you can see that there are many departments that may distort and compromise what the, what the proposition is, what the offer should be, what, what we basically say the positioning of the product ought to have been. 
Uh, and so to prevent that, you must get every department to, committed to serving the customer's interests and committed to the uh, idea or concept that was going to be developed for the customer. Now, that's a hard job. Purchasing people want to keep the cost down. So do the manufacturing people. The R&D people want big laboratories and et cetera, et cetera. So it takes a, a real leader in a company, a real uh, CEO, uh, to, to drive the, all the departments to work for the same boss, not himself. It sounds like he's the boss, but the boss should be the customer. And once that's achieved, once everyone is market-oriented and market-driven, then you can say you have truly a marketing company and not simply a company with a marketing department. Lately, there has been a lot of discussion about globalization of markets and globalization of marketing strategies. For some popular brands and popular products, uh, I think the trend is somewhat evident that companies are designing uh, products for the world market with global brands, global advertising campaigns, global marketing strategies, and even global production. Uh, for example, we can take the case of cars, computers, some of the toiletry products. This trend is especially evident in Japan and Far East, where companies have started designing the products for world market as a whole, even to the extent of launching the products in their own home markets after they have been launched elsewhere and tested and found to be successful. There is also another interesting trend. Uh, because of the flexible manufacturing systems, the needs of mass manufacturing technology can now be reconciled with customization. In other words, today the products could be manufactured in different parts of the world, supplied somewhere else, the marketing strategies may be decided at the headquarters, and strategies implemented throughout the world. Now, are these two irreconcilable trends or are they two sides of the same coin? Let us uh, discuss it with Professor Kotler, what his views on globalization of markets are. Well, uh, let me say that globalization itself first has to be understood, and that is that the world is becoming more interdependent uh, uh, through uh, what uh, the developments in technology, uh, communications, uh, transportation. It's much easier now to um, build brand names around the world and move goods around the world and so on. Now, some economies uh, have not joined the world in that sense. And now, one reason might be that the economy has a very large domestic market. This was our problem in the United States for years. We only did 5% of global work because we had such a huge market demand at home. I believe it's also India's uh, situation with such a large market at home. It is not pushing, exporting uh, successfully as much as it might because it's not like a country like Belgium, which with its 8 or 9 million people, that's a small market. Uh, Holland is 14 million. They need other markets. Finland, with its five million people, needs other markets. So the um, globalization uh, level of different country, uh, uh, countries differ. Now, I believe very strongly that every country would find it in its best interest to globalize. By that, I mean to open up its doors to the fresh winds of competition by allowing foreign investment to come in, and also to improving its own quality and exporting so that it becomes a world-class producer of certain goods and services. Recently, Michael Porter wrote a book called The Competitive Advantage of Nations, where he points out that certain countries have great reputations for certain products, like Italy for fashion and furniture, um, and you might say uh, uh, the Japan for its electronics and watches and cars and so on and so forth. Now, India m must find those industries which it has uh, potential natural advantage in, and it should build up world-class products and become the leading source of those products. A good example would be software. There's much talk about India uh, in the year 2000 being uh, perhaps the world's leading software producer. So I think that globalization is important, but don't take it to mean that it's a matter of standardizing a product and selling it to the world. Sometimes 
um, a product can be standardized around the world. It's the nature of that very product and industry. For example, uh, the Sony Walkman. Why do you change? Why should the color be changed for different places or the size change for different places? Generally speaking, electronics, uh, heavy equipment, and so on, uh, air, airplane engines, they don't need modification by country. On the other hand, food products, particularly, uh, maybe fashion products, they need uh, adaptation. And there, if you're going to be successful, you better change your product from place to place uh, as you find the cultures changing. There are various connotations to the word marketing. It is a customer activity in the marketplace. It is a philosophy dealing with customer satisfaction. It is also a managerial activity dealing with analysis, planning, and control of organizational activities with a view to maximize customer satisfaction while optimizing organizational goals. Now, there are different perceptions about the uh, role of marketing in a country like India. Some who think that since most of the products and commodities are in shortage, what will the marketing and marketing people do? There are others who feel just for the same reason that most products and commodities are not available in sufficient supply, that their quality is not as is desirable. Therefore, to improve the distribution efficiency and to improve the customer satisfaction, in fact, the role of marketing even increases. Also, there are views about the role and stage of professional marketing activity in a country like India. Does marketing as a professional activity lag behind in country like India compared to, let's say, the developed world? Let us hear Professor Kotler's views on this subject. In India, my guess is as follows, that marketing is in different stages of thinking and development in different companies. My guess is that in some of the multinationals like Unilever, Nestle, uh, it's a pretty advanced uh, uh, practice, uh, discipline. I mean, I, I know it's advanced in those country uh, companies in, in, in their own home bases, and I am sure that they are very smart marketers. And they're building very large companies that have economies of scale, which have built up strong brand names, respected brand names. On the other hand, you have cases in Hong Kong and Taiwan where these countries produce a lot of goods under other labels. And, and their good quality uh, is coming out, um, and yet these countries are not getting uh, recognition by putting their own brand names on, on these. And then there's some other uh, models. The Thai economy is probably practicing a different approach, but uh, there's some common characteristics which India should notice. Um, one common characteristic is that uh, these places uh, often welcome foreign capital uh, maybe not foreign goods, but uh, as consumers, but they welcome foreign capital and they look around the world to find the best that they can copy or import or license. That's what the Japanese did. Uh, they, uh, l they build quality into their products. They try to be producing world-class products. Um, they have a high ratio of business people, that's managers and entrepreneurs, to the number of bureaucrats. Uh, they have good relationships between government, business, and labor, and so on and so forth. I mean, you, you can find these characteristics, and they must mean that a country seems to be freer to grow. It's allowing, uh, what, it, what it's doing is, is protecting and encouraging private um, uh, private initiative. I might even say that another factor is these countries seem to have political stability. So therefore investment in these countries is justified and warranted. Now let's move to India. What is India's growth model? India's growth model is a, a central planning model uh, with ownership of state enterprises, um, at least in core areas. And also in some areas that are not really necessary, like why should India run hotel, uh, the government run hotels and make wristwatches? But in any case, it's more on the what we call the socialist model. And I understand the 
the reasons for that. And I understand the history of that model. And it's a kind of paternalism, paternalistic model, which says uh, capitalism could be corruptive. Uh, foreign multinationals might come to India and use us and, and exploit us. So we have to be very regulatory. We have to be very careful. Well, of course, that creates a lot of bureau bureaucrats who have power to license or not license. Uh, to, they don't take any risk. They have high tenure. Uh, there are political uh, bases for decision making, and a lot of that impedes the the actions, the, the actions and initiative of, of of people in India who who would create businesses and grow businesses and so on. It's very hard. I mean, if you have to wait a whole year to get a license. By and large, however, I suspect that most companies here are in a sales-driven stage, that marketing is considered a small appendage to a large sales department, and that those companies uh, will have to consider going through these kinds of stages I, I mentioned. And um, there will be resistance to that. And it boils down to a problem, which is called the problem of marketing marketing. How do you get marketing sold inside of the company which is often a harder problem than marketing to the outside. Now, I think that the, the message is clear, that some liberalization, the kind that uh, Rajiv Gandhi started, is desirable in India. Um, and that means you got a major problem of what do you do with the big bureaucracy? And, and do you privatize, or can you at least make state enter public enterprises more efficient and responsive and so on? And I think um, you should privatize where you can, and that will bring in capital. And you should give, give capital a chance to make money here, too, because uh, it's not a matter of charity. Capital is at risk. It could be put out easily elsewhere for a good return. To draw it into India involves political stability, commitment on both sides, and so on. So I, I think that India should study the m models of development of successful countries and uh, blend its own model, uh, as it has done in some other respects. I, I've noticed in what is called performance contracting by, uh, uh, with the government uh, enterprises, the public enterprises, that model was not an originally Indian one, but the way it came out, it was, it was blended from, different, from what the French have been doing and the South Koreans have been doing. It's now an Indian model, and I hope it works. It will make public enterprises work better, and I think that's the next step. So I, I believe that the talent is certainly there. But by the way, you could see in the behavior of overseas in, in the in, in Indian non-residents uh, that they are the driving economic force in many countries where they have settled. So when they are free to really build businesses and build wealth, they do a marvelous job. And uh, I hope that the marketing training that uh, is found in, in, in the universities here uh, prepares people to use the latest tools to run the business as well, whether they're working for multinationals or their own companies, uh, whatever. So I wish uh, the very best to, to uh, Indian marketing.